Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here and, and talk about Young Makers and something that I think is uh, uh, probably not on everyone's radar, but perhaps ought to be. I'm joined today by uh, Tony DeRose of Pixar, uh, who will be talking about a Young Makers program that he worked with us on to, uh, and we initiated it earlier this year. And then Karen Wilkinson and Mike Petrick of the Exploratorium. How many of you have ever been to the Exploratorium in San Francisco? Okay. Well, they, they have a great area called uh, uh, the Learning Studio inside it, and they work with uh, uh, teaching kids about, uh, well, really anybody, adults, anyone, about uh, how to do things. So, um, so we're going to talk. Um, I'm going to frame a little bit about Maker Faire and Make for you. And uh, uh, Tony's going to talk a little bit about uh, the Young Makers program, and then we'll kind of get back and... I want to talk to you about a few ideas I have and then uh, open up to, to questions as we go. I'd, I'd like to start with uh, uh, an in, it's a short industrial film. I'm just going to show you the beginning of it. And it was made in 1961, so it's, it's pretty dated. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully. Americans are, we are makers. With our strengths and our minds and spirit, we gather, we form, and we fashion. Makers and shapers and put it togetherers. We start young, finding out early in life what it's like to feel something grow and take shape beneath our hands. We start young and we stay young modeling with careful pride the things we expect to endure for ourselves and for others. We build for use and we build in fun, joining eyes and hands and brains into knowing teams that bring great dreams to life. So that was a little bit before OSHA. Um, <laughs> But, you know, 1961, and, and I'm going to tell you something really funny about that film. It was, uh, this looks like something from, from Mad Men. It says to all contact men, you'll be interested in knowing that American Maker is booked day and date with Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho in Detroit drive-ins. So this was something that was playing uh, in, in drive-in theaters before the movie Psycho, and I kind of think that today's maker audience is sort of a <laughs> Psycho-inspired mashup of making from, from uh, the early 60s. But, you know, it, 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 if you watch that whole, whole piece, uh, uh, you know, it embodies a, an idea that we are all of us makers, and it's something particularly American. And, uh, you know, f almost 50 years later, uh, President Barack Obama at, uh, talking to the National Academy of Sciences says, you know, we have to encourage kids to become makers of things, not consumers of things. So, you know, to some degree, there's been a disconnect between this idea of making things and uh, it now encouraging and, and trying to identify ways that we can uh, support that in our community. Well, um, Make Magazine is about six years old, and, and it is for this new generation of makers, of of technology enthusiasts. Uh, and that's, that's really one of the things I, in this track on play today, one of the ideas I'd like to get across to you is as, as almost a, a sort of a bedrock of innovation and, and what happens in this country is people play with things to understand them, to learn them, to know a, a, more about what that technology can do and more about what they can do with it. And I think that'll be a, a theme we revisit today. So today's, you know, uh, uh, makers are artists, they're tinkerers, uh, they're hackers, they're engineers, they're crafters. They span a whole wide range of fields and interests. But uh, 
uh, after I did the magazine for a year, I came up with the idea of, well, would, wouldn't it be kind of fun to put them together, to see all these people in the same space doing things, sharing what they do? First of all, I thought they would enjoy meeting each other. And second, I thought the public could, would really enjoy interacting with them. And so I took this idea of a fair and kind of reinventing a science fair and an art fair and a craft fair and a county fair and tried to bring that all together. I'm going to show you a short clip from about 2008 um, that uh, is called, uh, it features, uh, you know, just how many people are making things.
Good to know. My name is Andy, and I made a microfiche machine musical instrument. My name is Becky Sherman, and I made Ferret. I'm Jason Rujo, and I helped make Anomaly, along with Mary Craig. Thank you. So that was 2008. We just had our, our uh, fifth Maker Fair in the Bay Area, and it was, uh, it's a two-day event in San Mateo. We had about 80,000 people over two days. Um, our very first year, we had about 20,000 people. So it's really continued to grow. We had about 1,000 makers exhibiting. And uh, as Kitty said, tomorrow we're doing a small version, a mini Maker Fair in Aspen, uh, just to uh, collect some local makers here. And, uh, but at the end of the month, I'm doing uh, the very first Maker Faire in Detroit uh, at the Henry Ford Museum. And then at the end of September, doing uh, the very first one in New York City at the New York Hall of Science in Queens. So um, it's definitely something that's expanding and, and new people are, 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 are coming into this. But we had a, a particular uh, desire. As you can see in, in the videos, we're, we already have, we have families there, we have kids there. But we really wanted to begin focusing on, well, how do we get the next generation of makers um, uh, in greater numbers to Maker Fair? And uh, I'd like to introduce Tony to talk a little bit about the idea he came up with. Thanks, Dale. Uh, as Dale mentioned, uh, I work at Pixar. Um, I run the, the, the research lab there. So uh, I get to kind of invent things as part of my job, which is, which is great fun. Uh, they tend to be more abstract things. Uh, but one thing that binds us together at Pixar is that we all love to tell stories. And so let me start with a story. And this is a, a personal story. Um, I have uh, two sons, uh, Sam, who's now uh, 16, and Joseph, who's now 11. And Sam, in particular, has always been a maker and you know, has loved Legos. And uh, Joseph uh, loves Legos, but he's turning out to be more of, a, of an artist and, and storyteller. Uh, when Sam was maybe eight or nine, he started to want to go beyond Legos. And we realized there really wasn't much of anything for him to graduate into. And so we started you know, just working on little projects in the garage, most of which we didn't finish. Uh, but in 2006, we had the good fortune of uh, kind of stumbling upon the first Maker Faire in the Bay Area. And it was at that point that we realized, hey, we're makers. We, we now had a label for ourselves for this wacky thing we were doing. And we weren't alone. There were 20,000 other people there doing the same thing. So uh, that kind of inspired us. We went back in 2007. And then in late 2007, we started what has now become kind of a family tradition. Uh, toward the end of the year, around uh, the Christmas break, we try to pick a design challenge. And the goal is to uh, complete that design challenge and then, and then take it to Maker Faire. So uh, the, the, the first year, 
we decided to build um, a, a large multi-touch computer display, which you can now think of as a, as a giant iPod. Um, here it is uh, at the fair. And it was, a, it was a great project. It took us uh, probably about a month to complete. Uh, Sam was involved in every aspect of the design. And it was a, it was a project that really cut across just about every discipline. Uh, woodworking, physics, uh, electronics, computer software, um, uh, computer vision. So it was just you know, an opportunity to bring all those uh, disciplines together in a very focused way. Um, here's uh, Sam uh, in his pajamas, uh, working in the garage uh, late one night on uh, part of the sensor. Um, we took this to the fair in 2008, as I mentioned, and both of the kids ended up, you know, explaining the the uh, the exhibit to the attendees. Uh, we figured we had about five or six thousand people visit the booth over the course of the weekend, and it was. As a parent, it was just awesome to sort of step back and listen to them talk about every aspect of the design, down to the little geeky details, all the design trade-offs, uh, to adults. It, it, it was an experience that wasn't dumbed down for them. Uh, they were exhibiting right next to the uh, right next to the big guys, and uh, I, you know, I just stepped back and, and realized how incredible it was that, that, that they learned so much. I didn't have to force anything down their throat. They kept pulling this material. So at that point, we knew we were hooked. And uh, in late 2008, then, we started dreaming about the project that we, uh, or late, two, yeah, late 2008, we started dreaming about the project that we would take to the fair in the summer of uh, 2009. And a project that we, we generally do this discussion over, over dinner, so the dinner time conversation at our house is a little bit unusual. Uh, a, a few years ago, we had built uh, a fairly popular thing, which is a potato cannon. So it's, it's some PVC pipe that you, you glue together. I, yeah, these are boys, so you have to do things that are vaguely dangerous to keep their interest sometimes. Uh, you ram a piece of potato down the muzzle, and you spray hairspray in the back end for the fuel, and you ignite it. You can get a, you can get a potato to go about 400 feet. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, well, one of the kids was studying the, the Civil War at the time, and that's when Gatling guns were introduced. And so it was just natural to try to build a Gatling gun version of a potato cannon. Uh, so that's what we did in, uh, it, for 2009. Uh, so Sam worked out the, the, the design of the, the, the basic assembly, including the rotating barrels. And then uh, together we worked out the firing mechanism. So the way this thing works is uh, you, you control it with a, a remote control. We didn't want to be too close to the thing. Um, and we, we've learned a lot of safety issues uh, working on these projects. Uh, you uh, spin up the barrels, and then we worked out a firing mechanism so that each barrel fires as it reaches the top of the arc. And we can fire all six barrels in about a quarter second. The most uh, challenging part of the project was working out the firing mechanism. And uh, the key insight for that happened late one night. We were working together in the garage, frantically trying to finish this thing for the fair. And uh, we both just came to the same aha moment. And uh, like I said earlier, I, I invent things for a living. And, and that moment of discovery was one of the most satisfying I've ever had. Uh, I'm going to choke up here. <clears throat> you know, standing there together, Solving real problems, and, and Sam contributed every bit as much as I did. It was it was really incredible. We took it to the fair. It got uh, quite a bit bit of attention. Uh, the Make TV folks came by and did a little video. They posted it on YouTube. Uh, that video has now been seen about a million times. Um, yesterday, I'm kind of a mathematician by training. Yesterday, I was giving a talk at a math conference in Utah, and at the end of the introduction, my host mentioned the Gatling gun. So I'm apparently as famous for that as I am <laughs> as anything else in my scientific career, which is a little bit scary. But um, For 2009, uh, you can tell there's a progression here in complexity. Uh, for 2000, and danger. In, danger. <laughs> uh, in 2009, this was our project. Uh, it's a eight and a half foot tall metal animatronic fire-breathing dragon. Uh, <laughs> 
Why not? You know, this is Maker Fair. Anything that's cool is fair game. So again, this was a, a, a you know just an incredible uh, project to bring together all kinds of different disciplines. It really forced us to learn. This is our, this is our first metalworking project. It was our first project with pneumatics. Uh, there's embedded microprocessor control. There's, um, it was our first project with flame effects. Uh, so again, it was a, a really integrative uh, project. You can see Sam in the back there. Uh, you, you, you control the thing with a joystick uh, connected to a laptop. So again, this, you know, these are the kinds of projects that you know, just come from the kids. And we don't know how we're going to do these things at the beginning. He doesn't know. I don't know. Um, but somehow we, we make it happen. And it, the, the process creates so many learning opportunities in so many different areas. You're just able to bring so many ideas from physics and mechanics and chemistry uh, together in a way that's really relevant and, and, and real. And if you get it wrong, you can get hurt. So there's, you got some skin in the game. Um, this was pretty well received at the fair as well. At one point, we had uh, several film crews stacked up at the booth waiting to interview the boys. Uh, so there's, there's Sam on the left. Um, the, um, the guy in the middle is Alex, who's uh, uh, a member that we brought on as part of the Young Maker program that I'll talk about in a second, and uh, Joseph, my 11-year-old, who's, who's a terrific explainer and has ended up taking on the role of media director for these projects. <laughs> So it, it becomes just a complete family affair. Um, all right, so here's Joseph. Uh, and th this is a typical, if you know Joseph, this is a typical pose. Uh, he doesn't go anywhere without his video camera. And what I'd like to show you next is a little 40 second uh, trailer that he put together uh, for the making of video. So the making of video, he shot, he edited, he scored. It's about five minutes. You can find it on YouTube. Similarly, he shot, scored, and edited. Uh, this 40 second trailer. Now, of course, I think my kids are special, but, <laughs> uh, but no, 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 they're, no, they, I mean, they're talented, but I mean, we all know kids are born creative. They're born talented, and we too often drive it out of them. And that's really what the Young Makers program was about that we tried to pilot is, what about kids that are born makers, that want to do this stuff, that don't happen to have parents who are makers, and maybe don't have access to shop facilities? There's really no infrastructure in place to support them, to nurture them. And any infrastructure we had as a society, we've, we've basically dismantled. We've, we've closed shops and schools. We've, we've made risky behavior a complete no-no. We've made failure a bad word. And all those aspects are critically important to kids like this. And, and these kids are our future. They're going to be the ones you know, inventing the next Disneyland, which is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this uh, as, a, as a Pixar employee. These are the kind of kids that, that don't know the boundaries between different disciplines. They don't even know the boundaries between art and science. It all just mixes together in a way that expresses itself in creativity. And so what we wanted to do was create um, an opportunity and, and a community to support kids like this. So working with, um, with uh, Dale and uh, Mike and Karen at the Exploratorium, uh, we put together a pilot project uh, and started in January. Uh, we, uh, we knew we were going to get a lot of things wrong, so we wanted to start with a small group of kids. We started with 18 kids in January. We, we met with them monthly at the Exploratorium. Um, part of what we did each month was uh, a hands-on uh, session called Open Make that I think you guys will talk more about in a few minutes which was just an opportunity for them to be exposed to different kinds of making. Um, another thing we did each month was design reviews. Uh, the, 
we, we wanted the kids to uh, find a vision, and we paired kids with adult mentors, and it was the role of the mentors to help them find a vision if they didn't have one, and if they did have one, help them realize that vision. And then through these monthly meetings and these design reviews, ultimately uh, finish something to exhibit at the fair. Um, and try to make this ex the experience that's been so important to our family uh, accessible to other kids and other families. Uh, so here's um, one of the projects that uh, I think involved um, uh, sensors that could uh, detect cell phone usage and, and blink. Um, I want to tell you about a couple of the projects and a couple of the kids that came out of this, this uh, pilot run. Uh, this is Nathaniel. He's, he's age 12. The kids uh, were age, uh, age 12 up to age 17. And uh, he had a, a broken electric stand-up scooter, you know, one of these tricycle things. And it was just you know, collecting dust in his garage. And what he wanted to do was turn it into a, a chopper, you know, something that you sit down on. It's got big, long forks. And um, gee, uh, and I also want a big flame out the back. <laughs> Why not? Um, so we, uh, we here, here uh, Here's Nathaniel with his dad. Uh, his dad was very supportive, but didn't have a lot of skills himself. And so the mentor that we paired uh, with these guys uh, basically worked with the dad and the son to, to mentor them together. Um, here's uh, that mentor who's also another Pixar employee, Sean Neely. Uh, and here they're you know, scratching their heads over some design challenge. Uh, in the course of this project, Nathaniel learned how to weld. And he actually became the best welder in our shop uh, through this project. And uh, here's his final, his final thing. Uh, I'll have more to say about Nathaniel in a minute. But he came in with a, a project that you know, the, the adults were going, nah, I don't know. And he made it work. Uh, here's Evan. Uh, and his idea was uh, to build something he called the ladder vader. This is a, a container that you strap onto a ladder and then it runs up and down the ladder uh, carrying tools and materials uh, up to folks doing roofing jobs. So where'd the idea come from? I have no idea. But uh, he and his dad uh, worked together. And uh, this is the prototype. The, the final version was even more sturdy. And you know, I can see businesses being spun out of, out of some of these, these projects. Uh, there were three girls in the group. And <laughs> one thing we quickly realized is all the boys, for the most part, wanted to work by themselves and do something dangerous. And all the girls wanted to work together and do something actually beneficial. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, uh, here they are with their mentor. They, they made something they called the, the Habitable. And it was uh, a project that was inspired by the mothers of one of the girls, who was an interior designer. And she was frustrated by the fact that Habitats for small animals, you know, hamsters and so on, are really ugly. You know, they're just big hunks of wire and metal. And so they got the idea, you know, can we make uh, something that's, you know, a little bit more aesthetic? And so they, they bought an IKEA table and modded it. Uh, they, they, they cut the, the, the guts out of it. They built a maze that had, has moving parts inside, and uh, hamsters run around inside. Again, where, where do these ideas come from? I have, I have no idea. Uh, and here's uh, Colin and Joseph. Uh, it turns out they, they go to the same school. They're both interested in skateboarding, but they had never met each other <laughs> until this project. And their idea was to build a better, uh, create a better design for skateboard trucks. They're, they're into a version of skateboarding called longboarding, where you go really fast downhill. Again, the dangerous thing. Um, but they had an idea for uh, building a truck that would give them much more stability and control, especially at high speed. So we paired them with a mentor. Um, they did a full CAD model of, uh, of, of the gearing that goes inside their truck. They CNC milled it, and there it is sitting on the table. So again, you can just see the, the huge creativity. And um, we, we, didn't, uh, we, we didn't select kids super carefully. So I, you know, they may be sort of on the, you know, the high end of the distribution, but I don't think they're a standard deviation or two out. I think lots of kids have this in them if you give them the opportunity. Uh, in closing, I want to come back to, to Nathaniel's project. Um, you saw the, 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 the flaming chopper there a second ago. 
worked perfectly. You, he took it to the fair on Saturday. It wouldn't charge. It was dead. He brought his family. His grandparents were there. He had this big area outside. He was devastated. So uh, a few of us, his dad, his mentor, myself, we pulled out some test equipment. We sat down with Nathaniel. We kind of traced the problem back. We ultimately, and Nathaniel's in here participating every bit as much as anybody else in the project, eventually isolated it to a blown diode. He now knows what diodes are and how they work. Uh, ha had a field fix. He soldered a jump wire and got it, uh, got it working before, uh, uh, before the end of the day. And in talking to some of the parents afterwards, um, uh, Nathaniel's uh, mother, uh, Sarah, gave us this quote, which I, I think is really telling. I think Nathaniel's project was a success on many levels. He realized his concept, learned many new skills, managed the time it took to complete the vehicle, and met new people. In my mind, however, though, the biggest success was that a devastating end to Maker Fair was averted through support, teamwork, and tenacity. He learned something about overcoming adversity, and you can't get a better life lesson than that. So that's what this program is about. Thanks, Tom. So Mike, uh, the Exploratorium was a part of this, and do you want to just talk about how that worked, and then we'll show this small video? Sure. And so the Exploratorium is a, a hands-on museum of science, art, and human perception. And in a lot of ways, it seems like a natural fit. Why wouldn't we, um, our Exploratorium, um, par partner with Make Magazine and Tony's idea of young makers? But when we took a harder look, we realized that a lot of the people doing the making at the Exploratorium are the exhibit developers and the educators. Those are the ones who, behind the scenes, are tinkering and playing and exploring. They're learning new things by what they're building and what they're researching in order to create some pretty interesting interactives for the public to interact with. And when we thought, could we push on that model a little bit? And instead of create opportunities for visitors to come in and in, in interactive ways learn something about science, art, or human perception, could we create spaces where visitors could actually do a lot of the making, where they could leave their mark, where they could con construct and contribute to the environment that they're in as much as our exhibit developers and our educators? So as part of the, the Young Makers program, we opened our space up. We have a little space on the exhibit floor. We open it up once a month. And we tried to do that. So we have a, a short three-minute video to show you just a collection of, these are, all, these are all visitors to the museum who may not have known that this space was available when they arrived. Some of them spent several hours with us. It's their own choice. And I want you to watch for three things. First of all, these activities are not a typical make and take type activity. So in other words, although a lot of the similar materials are used as kids are exploring electronics or sound, each interaction is completely suited to the individuals who come in. So the outcomes are quite different. The other thing to watch for is this idea that adults and youth are working together or they're working side by side. We haven't created a youth area or an adults area. So each, each of the activities meet the levels and the interests at the different ages. And there's a really nice diversity in terms of gender. I think that um, we've, we've often found with the activities that we've developed, this is a really nice way of thinking about um, involving all ages and all genders. These are actually two explainers who are supposed to be teaching, but they didn't know enough about the activity at that point, and I just let them go, let them, let them explore a little bit. <clears throat> but finally, I think what's most important about these types of videos is that this, these are not the photographs and the videos that we're going to necessarily put on our brochure. Those aha moments where the little girl is jumping up in the air and smiling over her discovery, those are great, but that's actually what we believe is not the most important part of this project. The idea that there are pretty ugly photos of kids scratching their heads and wondering what's happening or being confused and something not quite working is really what we try to set the conditions for. So I'll be quiet while we watch just the rest of this and just want you to watch for some of those, those moments. They're exploring circuits here and building LED jewelry and other types of wearables that interact with each other. Mm -hmm. 
And all of the, most of these projects weren't taken away by the visitors. They were left by the visitors who made them to inspire and inform other visitors to, to, to show them what is possible. These are little piezoelectric pickup microphones that are amplified to collect interesting sounds. This is an exhibit that we actually found in the garbage, in the trash of the Exploratorium. And so the night before, a couple of our staff pulled it out and tried taking some hole saws that are used with drills and a few other things to see if they could revive. And this continues to evolve. But what, what looks like just messing around and goofing off is really focused, concentrated ideas that this kid is having at this moment. We love to watch it. This is an ancient technology called a phonograph. <laughs> and that's how it was introduced by our teenage explainers to the visitors. And these are different ways of actually listening to the vibrations through homemade um, speaker devices. These are conductive fabrics and conductive um, threads used to create bracelets and other jewelry using button-sized batteries and some scrounged electronic uh -huh. parts. And our staff are there not to lead and to teach, but our staff are there just to facilitate, to provide the right new material, to provide the right question if we feel it's important, and to help people get unstuck, but in their own way. Finally, this activity is one that we actually prototyped with prisoners in a, in, a, in, a, in a work release program in eastern Connecticut. There's a long story to that, but the idea that adults and youth are working together here, and this is a, a space filled with um, Home Depot parts, essentially, to build marble runs that allow you to explore different science principles, but other principles of, of movement. Do you want to say something about that boy? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think for me, open make was just a chance for people who, who didn't really know that their inner maker was kind of there, kind of lingering below the surface, and a chance for them to meet featured makers that Dale would interview in the morning, and then we had this space that they would come to in the afternoons. And I think um, I found going to my first maker fair five years ago, um, that there was this incredibly vibrant community out there filled with people doing all sorts of things, men, women, girls, boys, um, from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds. And that's what I hoped we would be able to offer at the Exploratorium to people coming in um, off the street, kind of slanting them in the direction of attending their first Maker Fair, too. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and a lot of people came back, right? Yes, yes. Actually, we saw that. Well, maybe I should yeah. be. This. I, I brought along. I might get all choked up too. So there was a, um, a one parent in particular that we saw at the very first open make, and she said that um, her son, who she brought, was 12 years old and that he was missing basketball. And um, we continued to see him for the next several months. So anyway, this is Leslie, who I came to know quite well, um, talking about the experience of open make and saying that it's an unusual place where they can uh, observe each other's approaches, collaborate and work independently. They can create and innovate at their own pace without being limited by kits or pre-specified -spec pre steps and outcomes. In the studio, my son worked with people of different ages, interests, and skills, all of them creating innovative, innovating, working and learning from each other's approaches. And in the school classrooms, he doesn't have the opportunity to do this due to limited times and fixed curriculum. And at home, he doesn't have this, the opportunity to mix with so many different types of people. And I think 
um, to me, to connect with a visitor who I didn't know and have come to know her now quite well over the course of time. And Chris is already looking forward to bringing more friends. He would bring a different friend each time um, to open make. And he's, he's already asking, when is the studio going to open again? That type of relationship to build with parents and kids um, is probably the most meaningful thing to me. So one of the things we're obviously here to explore a little bit today is, is how can this work for more people? How do we scale it? And, and, uh, and before quite going there, I want to sort of convey that um, one of the things when Tony came to say uh, to, to me to talk about doing the Young Makers program, he sort of got what Maker Fair was about, that it wasn't just building things. It was, it was a, a kind of an environment, uh, a, a very creative, uh, a bit even subversive environment, um, a, a bit dangerous, a bit uh, unusual. Um, and, and so I want to talk to you some, about something that I, I think the origin of, of this environment from doesn't come really from me or, or from Make, but it, it really originates, um, it, at least as a term, um, the hands-on imperative. And it, it comes from um, MIT. And there's a, uh, in 1960s, there's a small group of, of students, and they are in the Model Railroad Club. A club. They're not in class, in a club. And there's two groups. One works on the landscape, the things that you, you see there, uh, the terrain and putting up little villages. Another one works underneath, and they work on switches. And the group that worked on switches caught wind of computers, but they were mostly mainframe computers used by the administration, controlled by the administration, locked up by the administration. And for them, the hands-on imperative meant getting their hands on that technology, getting their hands on computers, to be able to open it up, see how it was made, to be able to figure out how to make use of it. And again, whoever was designing computers at that time had really no inkling that they could be used for model railroad clubs. And um, it was exactly that application that these students uh, um, uh, pioneered and, and began doing, and, and they were talking about hacking computers back then. And uh, again, if you're in the computer industry, you know that term is used today both positively and negatively, um, just as politician is. But, um, <laughs> but uh, hackers are people that take things and personalize them and make technology do what they want it to do. And I think in, in all of these areas, uh, you're, you're seeing that. And uh, you know, I just want to mention, uh, you know, there was another group um, on the West Coast that was doing something very similar, and it was also a club. It was a homebrew computer club. And look at those scrawny <laughs> uh, self-portraits there. It's in Menlo Park, and uh, particularly um, uh, one of the more famous members is Stephen Wozniak. And I just, I, I can't get enough of this quote. I just love going down to the homebrew computer club, showing off my ideas and designs. And, uh, designing neat computers, and I was willing to do that for free for the rest of my life. That's an enthusiast. That's a maker. And uh, you know, it doesn't mean he did it for free the rest of his <laughs> life, but you know, uh, that impulse to engage and to do things, to explore, to be creative, th they wanted their own computer, and they were going to build them. Um, uh, you know, and uh, you know, another uh, um, um, uh, person we saw yesterday is Bill Gates. And you know, he and Paul Allen read about a computer in, in a magazine, 1975, Popular Electronics, not that much different than, than Make. And they, they leave Harvard, and they go to New Mexico. Why New Mexico? Nobody's really figured out, except Ed Roberts had started the Altair Computer Club. And they wanted to hack computers. To, they wanted to figure out what they were good for, what could they do with them. And you know, I, I don't have to sort of make it so literal, but they, they not only found something to match what their interest was, but they created not only a business, they created an industry. Um, so the potential here from playing with technology, I think, is, is potential, uh, is pretty great. Um, and, and so, but I, I'd, I'd also like to, to say that I, I think we learn more I, I'd like you to think of the hands-on imperative as not being limited to things that you're literally grabbing with your hands. That um, it really is this idea of getting control of things, getting access to things, personalizing them. And, and uh, today, people think of getting their hands on data. 
They think they're getting hands on their own DNA, right? They're going to do something with that. And that's the hands-on imperative that, that I, I think that we really want to sort of, in, in all form and fashion, get that out to kids. Um, the thing that kids, we have an education day before Maker Fair, and they come, they get to meet all the makers and explore. We call it a backstage tour. The one reaction that, I, that summarizes, the kids said it was real. They met real people doing real things. And isn't it just awful that school isn't about what's real to them? And, and I, I think this is, I'd like to explore this a little bit. But this idea of clubs, um, not necessarily the traditional fashion of clubs, but we thought here with young makers uh, um, and, and other things, uh, how could these club models of, of things that are almost outside on the margins, they're out in our communities, um, how could new models for clubs lead to more makers? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I'd kind of like to open that up. And uh, you know, when we talk about, I'm going to just sit down here for a minute, but um, when we talk about making things, we need some kind of physical environment. In your case, it was a garage. Here, in your case, it was you know, a, a science center. Uh, we can imagine them occurring in lots of places, can't we? So what, what, what are some of the things we need in, a, in, a, in what I'm going to call for this conversation a maker space? So well, I think you need, <clears throat> I think you need somebody who um, is willing to take this, this risk with these youth, for sure. They're willing to sort of get their hands on tools, pull together materials that might get them started, and then be willing, and, and in some cases able, but maybe not expert, at sort of helping them along. I think that's important to any environment. I identify with the risk. I mean, Tony was OK with fire. I wasn't. I could, I could do power tools and uh, glue guns and stuff like that, but drew the line for myself uh, at well, fire. I, <laughs> let, me, let me talk about the risk issue, which um, I, my sense is that society as a whole is trying to eliminate risk from the lives of children. And I don't think that's a way to bring up children to learn how to uh, adequately ex assess risk because they're going to they're going to find risk in their everyday lives, and so we meet the risk issues head on in our garage, and we talk about it and and you know we take all the safety precautions and the only reason uh, I, we that I felt comfortable doing the fire effects is we had an expert, uh, Sean Neely had taken uh, several courses on flame effects had built a number of flame effects himself and so he was a consultant on on all the flame projects. And uh, we learned a lot about the safety mechanisms inside propane tanks and how to keep yourself you know, safe with fire. And so it was only through that kind of support network that I felt comfortable going there. But you really found getting kids to come to your garage and, and in your workshop was really a, a great experience. Right. Uh, I mentioned earlier that w we wanted to run this as a pilot because we knew we were going to make lots of mistakes. And, and uh, one of the things that we learned on the positive side is uh, as an experiment, I ran a couple of Saturdays, uh, called them Open Shop, and anybody that, you know, anybody in the group that just wanted to come by, you know, bring their project, you know, lay it out on the table, and, you know, whoever's there, you know, can help, um, uh, help with skills acquisition, help with uh, consulting. And those sessions in the garage were just tremendously satisfying. We would have about a dozen people, you know, this is a standard two-car garage, and I don't have a you know, full machine shop or anything, but uh, it's getting there. And, uh, the other side of space is, <laughs> is you don't need much to yeah, get right. started. A tabletop. We gave you batteries and LEDs. I saw someone succeeded back there with a lit <laughs> battery. Um, you could make things with minimal materials. There's some back there, great, red and a blue, or yep, another ones. Great. Those are called <laughs> LED throwies. And uh, it's a magnet, a battery, and an LED. And you kind of have to, you know, it's, it's not a hard project. But it's kind of a fun one, a, a sort of a hello world for, for, for uh, circuit making, if you will. Um, and the battery, I mean, the magnet is there because it'll stick to something. And you throw it up against something. Um, actually, it was, it was created by uh, some graffiti artists who uh, would throw them onto metal uh, beams on underpasses and other things. Um, it was a graffiti that could be easily removed. But. Uh, but it's just a, 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 you can actually learn a lot by just fooling around with simple projects like that. Um, the other element, and, and uh, we're open for questions, so if anybody has a question, raise your hand, we'll bring a mic around to you. Um, the, 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 one of the ways I think about Maker Faire is that, um, I don't, first of all, I, don't, I produce it, but I don't create it. Um, 
In other words, it, I coordinate it. I don't ask people to do certain things. They're already doing things. And, and I think of it as like a, a big machine that's kind of assembled for a weekend. And all the parts come from the community. All the parts exist out there. They might be in someone's garage, someone's uh, workshop. They might be in a studio. But they, they bring them out, and they share it with other people. And that creates this big, wonderful thing. And then Sunday night after 6 o'clock, it's all dissembled and, and completely gone. And with it is all that energy. And, and it goes back into the community. But it's harder to find. And, and that's what I think one of our real interesting challenges here. The DIY community is something that surrounds every school, every neighborhood. There are people like Sean who know flame effects. There are people that know electronics. They're in our communities. They're not, unfortunately, in our schools. They're not often in our museums. Um, these are interesting, talented people that I think mentor, can mentor uh, a new generation of young makers. So we're really interested in how to network those communities and how to uh, make available um, all, what already exists. And, that, and that's kind of the, the key thing I'd like to think about. And I started Make, and I started Maker Fair. These people existed. It was really connecting them together and giving them the opportunity to show um, what's possible. And, and I think all of us believe that if we give that kind of opportunity to kids, they will show us what they, they can do as well. Let's see if we have a question, anybody? Um, let's see, a microphone there. Hi. Um, I'm you're on. Okay. Um, I have, my name's Joe Silverman, and um, I had to laugh when I saw the potato gun mm -hmm. because my nephew, uh, while at Syracuse University, he was a sophomore, and he made a potato gun. He, he was a, definitely a, you know, science-oriented kid, and while he was there, um, he got in a lot of trouble because for about six months, he was shooting the potato gun out of the high-rise dorm, and and... But I mean, it was it was wonderful to know that he was so creative. He ended up did get in trouble for for it. He was completely dissuaded from you know, it kind of squashed his creativity. But I, it just gave me a lot of pleasure to sit there and watch what you were doing. Um, I also I, I just wanted to comment on the idea of bringing the the, the creativity of your um, you know what you do with this Maker Fair into the schools. I mean, it, our science programs are just kind of eliminating in so many ways that, that quest to be creative and fun. And I, I just would like your opinion on how do you do that? How do you bring it into your communities, into your local public schools? Well, you know, this is our challenge, honestly. Um, there isn't a, you know, to some degree, when you take anything creative into the school system, you know, you may lose what you wanted to very much bring in. So uh, that's a design problem that we really have to get our heads around. And I think I, I, you know, a, a basic model I have is I, we've got to build it up in the communities so it gets drawn into the schools and identifying it in the communities so that teachers, we had 500 teachers come to Maker Fair and register. They care about this. They want to see this in the school. So we have to work with those who are already doing it and probably more from a bottom-up perspective than kind of a, 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 a top-down uh, directing people to have it. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of STEM programs out there that, um, uh, you know, I think fit that model of what uh, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, that kids really aren't engaged with. And this is the, the real opportunity here is kids get actively engaged in projects and doing things and um, they're not uh, being told what to do. Our goal, I, I think, in education should be taking kids from, who are directed to learn to being self-directed. I mean, that's the 21st century skill set that we want to develop. Which, okay, so back, back, yeah, on, yeah. I mean, you also, you might, there's at least one teacher at any school that is always getting in trouble because they're doing something a little bit different than the norm, than the curriculum. And what we've been finding lately is the best way to support them, at least through the Exploratorium, is to get those select teachers involved in an after-school program that's doing these types of things, or maybe starting an after-school program at their school or in their local community. And then what happens, we've found, is that the kids tend to say, why isn't this happening in my other classes? Why are my other teachers thinking this way? And then the teacher has a little bit more you know, ammunition to sort of think about how to address these issues and how to support him or herself as they move yeah. forward. I was just going to say that there are a number of uh, science teachers in independent schools that are doing this already in their classes. They basically have their own young maker program 
going in their science classes, and, and a number of them uh, bring all the class projects to Maker Faire and show them off. So it is happening, uh, mostly independent schools at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would be nice to we, we, we had can, yeah we had in the Bay Area we had two independent uh, these public school systems uh, host their own maker fair like a district level maker fair so getting kids to make things and one of the things that uh, I should point out about maker fairs it's not really a competitive environment we don't we don't uh, uh, require kids to do things to get um, an award or anything like that. It is a creative environment, so we really we, we view it as a deadline. Uh, it's a time to get your work done and bring it and, and let everybody see. Because we want to see the variety of what people come up with and not um, uh, narrow it down. Yes, in the back. I'm going to do um, talk about what's going on in Houston right now. The Houston Children's Museum, which I yeah. think you all Mm -hmm. um, has been my baby for 30 years, and our trademark is it's the ultimate playground for your mind. And um, because Texas education is what it is, um, we have actually uh, brought teachers in to teach them how to, with your help, um, what to do. We are serving as a model for children's museums who are changing around the country to becoming much more non-directive exploring and touching. And I think a lot of other people in this room could bring back to their communities what we in Houston are doing. But if you all want to come down in May of 2011, we're going to have the International Children's Museum Fair down there um, talking about what could and should be done. So Great. And they're doing much more than just creating a space for this type of thing to occur. Like, she, like you said, they're working with local teachers, but actually working with every single staff person in that organization to make sure that there's training and support and ongoing development of these ideas Rather than just adopting a new thing and, and laying it out for everybody else to follow, they're now generating new thinking and new ideas. It's a great program. Another question, Kitty? Yeah, I just wanted you to share your story a little bit about this. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, part of what happens is uh, there's a, I, I, my next Make Magazine will have a story called Kid Robot, and it's based <laughs> on a young man from Detroit. Um, and what I, I was kind of seeing there, um, based on sort of doing some community work to for preparation for, for our Maker Fair there. You know, we had some open meetings and people came in. And uh, he had moved to Detroit in the last year. Um, he was building robots for factory automation. And he wanted to meet others uh, in Detroit who might help him with his, his build his robot. He put an ad on Craigslist for hobbyists because he said, I don't want PhDs. I don't want, um, you know, people that are really specialized. I want people who kind of can play with me and, you know, come up with solutions to problems. And he was a kid who was raised by a single mother in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, and uh, really never fit into school at all. And she worried about him uh, quite a bit, took him to the Mayo Clinic. They diagnosed him with a genius IQ, but he just couldn't do things in school and, and fit that model. He get, began entering some uh, Skills USA competitions, some robotics competitions, find, found out that he loved doing that. And, uh, you know, I, he was telling me some of this background over dinner. And while he was young, I had, uh, he was telling me that he had a $10 million company building these robots. And, you know, I kind of looked at him after a while. And I said, how old are you? He says, 21. You know, he didn't go to college. He went, at 17, he started his own robotics company, and he'd been four years into it. And you know, there's a lot to learn, and 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 uh, you know, he'll have many different paths. But it's you know, the the interesting thing for both him and for Detroit was that people were moving there to meet others, and they were loosely forming together in in small groups, almost just to do projects together in, in the business sense. Um, you know, we're gonna do a project, we're gonna demo this, and then we'll all go back to do our own work, and then we'll get back together. I thought it was very much like rock bands, and there's almost this metaphor here of garage bands and garage inventors. Really very similar, um, you know, you try to find people that have similar interests, similar abilities, and, and you combine in new ways. Yes, we've got a question here. Yeah. Let's get the microphone to you. Thanks. I'm Mary Ellen Rogers, and I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. You talked early on about how do you scale this. Any of you, I'd be interested in your thoughts about how we can connect with the old traditional shop programs in high schools or the Votex or the community college or the generation of retired specialized machinists who would love to mentor and would love this as an outlet 
both for the intergenerational connection with the kids, but also they are not going to be satisfied by a traditional sure. college education. How, sure. do, how do we mobilize that? Yeah, well, um, let me just say first of all, I think vocet is a really interesting area relating to me, but we also have to throw out a bunch of ideas that that, that trouble that. Um, I mean, I'd love to have the space, I'd love to have the tools, I'd love to have those mentors come in. But we did this separation of manual and mental work. And even that, that old uh, American Maker video talked about brains. It talked right. about, you know, really uniting hands and brains. And there's a great uh, book called The Hand, and it talks about how, how we're particularly wired, you know, to, and it's a special way to use our hands, to, to think with our hands and to work with our hands. And I think it's a completely interesting alternative track that we could build for students that aren't connecting into the traditional curriculum and would really learn by making because my my goal in a voc ed program would be to convince them that they were capable people you know who could learn anything right and then they begin to integrate back in not that they're only good at a few things right that they and we start with sort of a capabilities based idea what can you do yeah. what would you like to do yeah I, I think on the scaling issue my sense is that there's so much potential out there that a big part of what we can do is just demonstrate how simple it is and what ingredients you need. And there aren't many. Right. You, need, you need some people that, that have some skills. And as you point out, they're all over the place. Um, you need, um, I, I think you need a deadline to make sure that, that things get done. And Maker Faire is a great deadline in the Bay Area. Uh, there are many Maker Faires uh, sprouting up. Um, and you need some uh, mentors and some shop space. The, the kids will come. Uh, yeah, I think the key is it can be done by a few people. I don't think we need, you know, this, you know, even if a few people are, you know, say, can I get this shop class and open it up to the community a bit. Um, so the thing that really, it would be wonderful, because many of those elderly also don't have a space to work in. Right. And they'd be willing to, to do mentoring just to have, have back a place to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be sanctioned by Make Magazine. I no. mean, I think this is what we're talking about. But, but I think there's a role that we could all play in providing networks. The word so is blessed. <laughs> <laughs> providing, you know, tapping into the networks and sort of making it clear. Who are the resources and what are the resources in your area? Where are the shops? Who are the people? And where can you get the stuff? Because right. it's, it's, it's available in each of the areas, and it just takes some time to tie those things together. Yeah. But I, I think this is... What we would like to see is, is this idea of maker spaces um, being organized and set up. And uh, again, they could be very different from each other. But I, I, that's why I was kind of going on the hands-on imperative. I, I feel it's pretty critical that they share a few design goals, a few yeah. um, values in what they're doing. Uh, you know, and it's the, the, the other example from education is sort of in the STEM curriculum, a lot of hands-on science that doesn't really, you know, it's hands-on, but it's not creative. It's not explorative. Uh, you know, you don't discover anything. You just follow a recipe and, and convince yourself that everyone else did the same thing that you did. And so. we should be developing these. We should develop a good set of principles, right. things like, you know, exhibition rather than competition in terms right. of just a, a, an, an approach and demonstration. Yeah. So just, yeah. I think mean, there are a lot of them we've been throwing around. And, and we talked about those values and the culture that we wanted to build, you know, late last year as we were starting right. to think about how to put the program together. And a couple of the key things that rose to the top for us, one was that it be, be child-driven, that we shouldn't say, you know, here's a thing that you have to go do, um, that it should be open-ended, that it should be, we should encourage projects that are really multidisciplinary, um, and, um, and it should be collaborative, you know, a, a, a situation where rather than being competitive and tearing each other down, uh, that everybody works together and, and, and feeds off each other's energy. And we have this saying at Pixar called plussing. You, you, you hear an idea, some of which is good and some of which is bad. You find the, the things that are good and could be made better and you plus them. And so that was sort of the, the dynamic that we wanted to create in this group. And I, I think we succeeded and you could really see it come to life in these open shop sessions. So I think the more we can make those, those ideals explicit and, and, and give mentors yeah a few tools yeah. for making that happen. Um, and again, I'm, part of the reason for us to be here is to try to meet other people that want to help make this happen across the country. Um, you know, it's, it's not, um, uh, you know, it can, it, it, it's going to happen. Um, I, <laughs> I'm convinced of it, um, but we all have to work on the details.
Any other questions out there? Okay, I'm going to uh, uh, wrap up just to remind you, uh, tomorrow, 10 to 3, I'll just tell you a little story, just, like how you do this stuff. You know, um, we, we talk, Kitty says, can you do a maker fair here? And I, I don't know, we'll find, you know, we'll blog it and we'll see if there are makers in the area. So we got Denver Mad Scientist Club coming up here, Spark Fund, which is Boulder, Colorado, does, uh, sells lots of electronic parts. Um, you know, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have you coming, right? And, and with <laughs> looms basic. back. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So a lot, but what, one of the cool things, someone wrote me and says, uh, sent me a picture from 1977 of a group of boys well, largely sitting around um, then a, a, an early kit computer. And he said, you know, if you're doing an Aspen Maker Fair, you should dedicate it to Nick DeWolf. And Nick is, he said, a, a, a prototype maker and a maker of prototypes. He, he uh, was an MIT grad who uh, found, co-founded Teradyne in Boston, then moved to Aspen. And he's the creator of the fountain down in, in Aspen. Mm -hmm. It's a computer-controlled fountain. And, and this, this um, man wrote me uh, from New York uh, saying, that's me in that photo. And uh, Nick got us all together as kids, taught us about computers, and we formed the Aspen Computer Society in 1977. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nick had all these sort of great ideas and said, you know, technology had to be used with a purpose, you know, art and, uh, and fun. And we were the two purposes that they came <laughs> up with, which I think was wonderful. Yes. And uh, uh, that fountain is about 30 years old. Nick's passed away, but his family, I think, later this month is going to be doing a, a celebration for that. But you discover makers. Um, through this exercise. That's my real joy in this, is Where's finding it going to be? people and doing things. It is at Gondola Plaza, or the um, uh, foot of the Aspen Mountain, right? And uh, it'll be out there about 10, and it's really informal. I mean, it's just a chance to talk to people. Uh, we'll have more LED throwies. If you have any kids and you live in Aspen, bring them, bring them, bring them. We'll be so. dissecting electronic toys. Yeah. <laughs> as long as so. they last. So thank you all for coming today and your interest. I appreciate it. Thanks.